cabinet members here. Welcome to all, and some, some, here, some online um, and previous cabinet members. We've uh, had a wait a while for this meeting after the election, so I'll start off by welcoming all members and officers to this meeting in the cabinet, which will be held as a hybrid meeting. The meeting is being recorded and will be available via the council's website to be viewed as soon as practic practicable following the meeting. Everyone participating in the meeting will be accessing this meeting either from the council chamber or from remote locations. Please could everybody assure that mobile phones are switched off or to silent mode. Members will have received an electronic copy of the agenda. I will ask officers to present the summary of the key points. For the record, the agenda can be viewed on the council's website. Members and officers will be speaking at various points during the meeting and those speaking may switch the microphones and the cameras on at that point. But I would ask that with the exception of myself as chairperson, at all other times, you keep your microphones switched off as this will help to minimise any background noise and interference and ensure the connection remains as stable as possible. All members attending remotely are asked to keep the cameras on throughout the meeting. If any members or officers wish to raise a point or question, you should press the hands up icon top right hand side of the Microsoft Teams window. I will welcome you to the, in order I receive requests. Please lower your hand once you have finished speaking. The chat button has been disabled for this meeting. Please do not use your microphone until I invite you to do so. Officers from Democratic Services will be supporting the meeting and will be monitoring the use of microphones throughout the meeting and where necessary will mute those not being used. I would also ask officers to introduce themselves as and when invited to speak during the course of the meeting. They too should ensure microphones are switched off when not in use, please. So we'll now proceed to the agenda of business for today, the Cabinet meeting of Tuesday, 23rd of July, 2024. The first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Uh, Councillor Gabby, I've just said she can now hear, I think she's in the right link. We have Councillor Martin Jones online and I think Councillor Howard Williams I was just trying to join online. I'm just trying to see if they have, it has joined successfully. Leader, can I just check that you can hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Right. I, my, my camera is not working and I'll, I'll persevere. I hope I can make it to the end of the meeting. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Williams. Great to have you as well. Everybody in attendance. I'm just still trying to see if the Deputy Leader, can you hear us yet? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Leader. Great, thanks. I'm not sure what went on there with the, the link. Right, any other apologies? Um, we all do. Right, okay. Item two then, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest from members or officers in accordance with provision of members' code of conduct adopted the Council from 1st of September 2008? Councillor Kaparos. Uh, thank you, Leader. I have to declare a prejudicial uh, interest in item six, as my spouse is employed by one of the contracting firms. And you will not take part in that debate and leave the chamber at that point. Okay, thank you. Councillor Eagle Thank you, Leader. I also like to declare interest on agenda item six, and I will be leaving the cha chambers. Mr. Melanie Evans. Okay. Um, yes, I would actually like to declare a personal interest in item five, as I am a school governor at Croisty Primary, and which is mentioned in the report. And I too would like to declare a prejudicial interest, as I am a job share with Eugene, who has got a prejudicial interest in item six. Please. Thank you. And Councillor Martin-Jones. Thank you, Leader. Um, can I please declare a prejudicial interest for item number eight, which is in relation to community asset transfer for Langina Football Club. As a local ward member, I have supported Langina Football Club through the process of applying for CAP support. So therefore, I'm going to declare a prejudicial interest. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jones. That's all declarations. Nothing further? No? Okay. Right, we move to item three then, the minutes, approval of minutes from 16th of April and the 14th 
of me and conscious of something the new cabinet year wouldn't have been in those meetings. Move, Leader. Second. Thank you, Councillor William. So moved and seconded. That's both 16th of April and 14th of May. Okay. So move item four, corporate health and safety policy 2024. I think Lindsay's online, yep. Move to you, Lindsay. Thank you, Leader. For the purpose of the recording, I'm Lindsay Harvey. I'm the Corporate Director for Education Early Years and Young People. Leader, with your permission, I'm going to hand over to Robin Davis, who will present uh, not just this report, but also the Learner Travel mm -hmm. Report at item six, if, if that's OK, Leader. Yep, thank you, Lindsay. Over to you, Robin. Thank you, Leader. Um, thank you, Lindsay. The, so I'm Robin Davis for the record. Um, I'm Group Manager, Strategy, Performance and Support. Um, so the purpose of this report is to report uh, and to seek approval um, for the new corporate health and safety policy. So the background uh, to the report is that the Health and Safety at Work Act requires that as an employer with more than five employees, the council must document its general approach commitment and arrangements for managing health and safety. Uh, across the organisation. Um, this is achieved through the creation and approval of a, of a corporate health and safety policy. Um, in addition to that, the council um, must maintain and revise that policy on a regular basis to ensure that it remains relevant and reflects any changes in management or organisational arrangements. Uh, the current policy um, was approved back in 2017 and that policy formed the basis of the current review um, by the Corporate Health and Safety Unit. Um, that's been taken through a process which has been endorsed by the Corporate Health and Safety Steering Group uh, and that policy now better reflects the current organisational and operational arrangements across the organisation and provides greater clarity of existing roles and responsibilities. So in terms of the proposal, uh, the current Corporate Health and Safety Unit Action Plan includes a commitment to review the health and safety, corporate health and safety policy um, to ensure that it encompasses current undertakings and any foreseeable future activities. The policy draft has been shared with, as I say, the Corporate Health and Safety Steering Group, um, which has provided some very useful comments and feedback, uh, and the group includes trade union colleagues. Um, there were some minor typographical changes and some points of clarification, and these have been included in the new revised policy draft, um, which is included as part of the pack. Um, following approval by Cabinet, if Cabinet are minded today to approve the policy, it's intended then that the policy will be communicated to all staff through our, all our existing communication channels, uh, and obviously welcome our union colleagues in supporting that activity. Um, the Corporate Health and Safety Unit will review the policy on a regular basis um, and if there are any significant changes required, the policy will be proposed for amendment accordingly. In terms of equality implications, um, there'd be, there would be no negative impact um, on any of the protected groups um, or any social economic disadvantage in respect to the Welsh language. In terms of wealth, uh, well-being and future generation implications, um, uh, I'm not uh, proposing to go through each of the, um, the five um, areas there, um, but the, um, the policy is um, supportive of um, the Wellbeing and Future Generations um, Act and implications. Um, there's no climate change implications and uh, there are no safeguarding or corporate parenting implications as a result of the, um, this report or the policy. Uh, and similarly, Leader, there's no financial implications as a result of the report or um, progressing the policy. Um, so the recommendation to Cabinet today is to approve the new Corporate Health and Safety Policy 2024, um, which is included, a draft is included as part of the public pack. Thank you, Leader. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Robin, for that. Then just to put it in order, first group of mover and second uh, for the recommendation. To move that, please, Leader. Councillor Martin George. Yes, thank you, Leader. Can I second uh, Councillor Eugene Kapolis's proposal, please? 
Thank you. Hi, hi, Robin. Thank you very much uh, for you and your team's work on this report. Uh, I was very pleased to see uh, the involvement of trade unions, uh, particularly with workplace inspections, but more so when the report and the policy touches on creating a, a safety culture amongst everyone in the Council. I did notice one of the responsibilities on there uh, was that people should stop any activity that, in their professional opinion, posed a risk to people or property. And I understand under HASWA 74 that that is uh, an ob obligation really on all employees. But how, can, I wonder if you could tell me or, or help explain to everyone how uh, we are going to be using this poly to help uh, empower our staff to be able to do this with confidence. Thank you, Councillor Kaparos. Um, very useful question there. I think the first thing to say is um, about um, the responsibility have, we have obviously to ensure the competency of not only our staff, which are working in a corporate health and safety unit, but the competency of our staff working across all our service areas in respect of um, sufficient training um, and um, experience, uh, giving them experience and knowledge and ability to carry out their duties. Um, Obviously, the Corporate Health and Safety Unit um, operational staff are trained health and safety professionals. And as you're right in the policy, they have um, a remit uh, if they um, uh, see a situation where there's an unsafe activity um, to stop that activity immediately, particularly if there's an imminent danger to life, uh, limb or property. Um, we'll be very, obviously very keen to engage with all our stakeholders in terms of um, where we feel there is a, a serious breach um, of health and safety um, responsibility um, to make sure that obviously we are educating our uh, staff uh, in respect of the risks associated with uh, our statutory undertakings and particularly um, in respect of our operational um, procedures delivering uh, our services, particularly out there in our communities. So um, the Corporate Health and Safety Unit will you know, engage um, dynamically and actively with stakeholders, support um, sufficient training um, for our staff, making sure that um, we'll engage in um, with trade union colleagues and managers in particular have a very important role in that respect um, to ensure that um, we are reporting the emissions, that we are investigating any incidents uh, and that we are acting according to health and safety um, legislation and our uh, corporate responsibilities in line with the new policy. I hope that helps. Thank you, Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Robin. And then we'll go to the Deputy Leader and then to Councillor Farr after that. Thank you very much, Leader. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, I have no concerns about the policy. Uh, like Councillor Kaparos, I was really pleased to hear that the trade unions have been heavily involved and engaged with. Um, how will this be communicated, though, to staff and how are we going to measure the effectiveness of this? And I'm also conscious that we have uh, various duties in relation to health and safety executive, where we, whereby we have to report near misses, any accidents and instances. Um, as an example, if somebody's off as an, a result of an accident in work, uh, there's a specific period of time and then we have to report it to HSE. I think that's always useful to know. Um, and I think the other thing that I would say is it's everybody's responsibility to ensure safety at work. It's not just us as members, it's across the, the county borough and indeed any members of the council as well. So we all have that obligation. So I think it's worthwhile highlighting that. Thanks very much, Robin. Thank you, Deputy Leader. I think those are very good um, questions and very relevant points in terms of communications. Um, you know, we we will rely on our internal mechanisms such as agendas, managers disseminating inform disseminating information, colleagues within HR, off off obviously offering training courses to staff and making sure that um, there's good uptake on them in terms of 
measuring effectiveness. There are a range of performance measures in place, and you me mentioned um, accident reporting. We do have an online accident reporting system that um, should be being used dynamically. Uh, and we've recently undertaken a review of that system and a new uh, a new system, um, an amendment to that system is going to be launched in September um, with support from our colleagues within IT who have been working to support that review of that system. So there's quite significant data in that system at the moment that's telling us about the effectiveness of our processes and procedures across our services and how managers um, are taking forward then the investigation of any incidents, accidents and the emissions. Um, and of course, you mentioned our responsibility around health and safety, uh, particularly HSE um, and RIDO reporting. And again, that um, um, you know, those those incidents should be re being reported centrally. And there is a piece of work around communicating um, service leads responsibility, informing the corporate health and safety unit who have a direct then responsibility to report redor incidences um, to their health and safety executive. So there's 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 much going on, but there's still lots obviously to do. Um, and this, I think the important thing, this is under continuous review um, and this strength within the corporate health and safety unit in terms of their knowledge, expertise, um, and their ability to engage then um, and support all our services in schools in terms of improving um, reporting, communication, uh, and acceptance of health and safety, as you've rightly said, is everybody's responsibility. Thank you for that, Robin. What comes to fire next? Thank you, Leader. A <clears throat> couple of questions for, for me, Robin. My first question is, it says in the report that the staff have actively engaged in uh, designing this policy. Can you tell me how did you consult with all staff? First question. Second question, um, in the report it says that the managers have responsibility to, to undertake a risk assessment of the activities they do. Can you tell me how do you monitor that that managers are do, to doing that, and if they're if they're not doing that, what kind of support is available to them? What action do we take for any breaches? Thank you. Yeah, thank. Happy to come back on that one, Lydia. Yeah. Um, thanks, Councillor Farr. I think um, the the active engagement is by the stake um, the, the health and safety steering group. So this um, representatives from across. So, directorates that sit on that on that group. Um, so they are effectively champions of health and safety uh, within each directorate and then take back to directorate um, health and safety groups uh, any kind of corporate issues. So that's the that's the engagement that's that's referenced. In terms of managers' responsibility or risk assessments, um, part of the role of the corporate health and safety unit is to support um, with the advice and guidance and um, the, the health and safety unit, I would say a significant proportion of their time is out there working with schools and services um, in our communities, ensuring that there are some adequate risk assessments in place and where they're not working with service leads then to put in place those risk assessments and ensure there's adequate mitigation in place around any of the risks that are identified. I would say that's a very dynamic arrangement. Um, and I you know I see on a regular basis the work mm -hmm. of individual health and safety advisors working with our service leads around those matters. Um, and you know the, the the monitoring effectively then is is through um, the directorate's monitoring on the on behalf of the organisation of whether or not um, there are sufficient um, risk assessments in place and um, of a good enough quality to um, for us to obviously use operationally and ensure that we meet in our health and safety responsibilities. Thank you for that, Robin. Um, there's no further questions. Be moved and seconded, as in paragraph 9.1, the recommendation to approve the corporate health and safety policy. I think it'll be all in favour. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. So we move now next to item five: the outcomes of the ST inspections report. Um, Lindsay, are you taking this one? Yes, please, Leader. Thank you. 
Thank you, Leader. The purpose of this report is to provide the Cabinet with an update in respect to the outcomes of the Eston inspections in Bridgen schools during spring term 2024. Specifically, this report provides information in relation to the inspections of Betos Primary School, Blangaro Primary School, Breckler Primary School, Kevin Glass Infant School, and St Mary's Catholic Primary School. Leader, this is essentially an information report, and mindful of today's Cabinet agenda, I don't intend to read through the detail of every school's uh, summary. I would, however, like to take this opportunity to thank the staff and governors of the five schools included in the report for their hard work and dedica dedication in ensuring our pupils receive the very best learning opportunities. Today's report provides information in respect to the strengths and areas of development identified by Eston at each school. The report also highlights the requirement for the local authority and Central South Consortium to continue to work with each school to address all of the recommendations made by Eston following their inspection visits to the individual schools. It's also worth noting, Leader, that Estin has asked St Mary's Catholic Primary School to prepare a case study on its work in relation to the provision of high quality learning experiences for the youngest pupils. I'm naturally delighted to note that this, as, as another Bridgend school, has been asked to share effective practice by Estin. So, on that positive note, Leader, I take you to paragraph nine and ask the Cabinet notes the contents of this report. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. I take uh, members to the recommendation first, to move and second. Councillor Jones, Martin Jones. On mute, Councillor Jones. Yes, Leader, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm afraid I can't hear you. Oh, hang on. We, move, we look at the move and second report first. Okay, thank you. Can I please move the report? Thank you, Mr. George. Deputy Leader. I'm happy to second, Leader. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll come back. Councillor John, do you have any questions on the report? Or any comment? Yes, can I can I um can I please thank Lindsay and his team and, and the, all the teaching community across the county borough for the hard work that they do, uh, especially when confronted with an Estin inspection. Um and you know, we need to understand and accept that the, Estin inspections do present a certain amount of stress worry for our staff, but I'm pleased to say that, that our staff are more than capable of, of delivering and are more than capable of, of showing Estin inspectors what they're really able to do. Um, my one question to Lindsay, if I may, only recently Estin announced a different type of inspection process uh, and are moving away from some form of grading system can I ask what ideas and what proposals do we have in the county borough to address, first and foremost, how we um, how we engage with Estin regarding their new proposals and how are we going to communicate this across all our schools in the county borough? Thank you, Leader. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Leader. Thanks, Councillor Jones, for the questions. Um, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate Estin, really. They've been incredibly open and transparent with engaging with all of the stakeholders and delivery partners around the new proposals, the new framework, and that's certainly welcomed by myself and other education directors across Wales. We've certainly seen schools involved actively in this process as well. Um, one of the key bits that Estin has really tried hard to do is to adopt uh, this ready already approach that really um, mitigates some of the impact. As Councillor Jones has said in the past, um, Estin inspections can be quite daunting, but Estin have made really big strides forward working with delivery partners to really um, tune down some of those anxieties. So I would certainly congratulate Estin on that. Uh, moving forward, there are some changes. There's some changes to the school inspection and also um, from well, over the last couple of years, really, to the local government education services framework. And there's two ways of communicating this. One, we will be holding a members briefing in autumn term to communicate the changes to all members. And also through the ready updates we have from Estin, we will be communicating this to all of our schools through the Monday mail shot. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Leader. Hey. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Councillor Jones. We'll now go to the Deputy Leader. Uh, the only I don't have any comments to make other than my congratulations to the staff. I think it's an ordinarily difficult time, particularly as they were on the back of COVID as well. So they've made all these, they've addressed any concerns and they have moved so positively forward. Um, really, my congratulations from all of Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Leader. Councillor Paul David. 
Start again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lindsay, for the report. And I'd like to congratulate yourself and all the staff and Poop and everybody involved. Um, <clears throat> I go back to the um, the stress involved in um, Eston inspections, Lindsay. Um, I've been involved in a school which failed um, an inspection report. Um, it's based on the inspection, sorry. Um, could you t tell me what the mitigation are given to staff when they do fail? And because it, it becomes extremely stressful then. And um, what consideration is given to the mental health of the staff? Because we're all aware of what happened up in England with the lady head teacher. You know that um, she actually committed suicide, didn't she? Um, after um, a negative report up there. So obviously there is always that ever-present danger that um, something could go wrong. You know. So do you know what Estin do in relation to that, please? Okay, one say, yeah? Please. Yeah, thanks, Lena. Thanks, Councillor Davis. I, I think it's threefold, and I think everyone recognises that the well-being of staff is vitally important. So, from a local authority point of view, we've got an employee assistance programme, VIBAP, um, that's available to all staff. Now, in addition to that, we provide all head teachers where required with a Bridgen buddy, we call it, um, another head teacher's experience, and that works particularly well with um, less experienced head teachers. We also, where applicable, um, team head teachers up with mentors, and this helps as well provide that. Um, in addition to that, one of the things that this, this director does well, we believe, is that we are uh, always an open door. We communicate well with our head teachers and governors for that purpose. And I think that's important. We always provide a facility to, to talk. With regard to Estin, going back to the point I raised with uh, in response to Councillor Jones's point, they've made huge strides forward with the, the ready already, the Barrod and Barrod uh, approach, where they've involved stakeholders significantly in the approach to, to Estin and really worked hard to make sure that it's as, as low stress um, as possible. And as I said to Councillor Jones's question, I would certainly congratulate Estin on that approach. And that's certainly the positive feedback I've received from head teachers in response to it as well. And I think the final thing, I think one of the things that we, we would encourage and in the spirit of Barrod and Barrod already ready we don't want to see inspections as an event we don't want to see schools and prepare for singular events we want our schools to be excellent at all times so when we maintain that um, that high quality learning environment and high quality teaching it doesn't become an event but rather the norm so thank you Councillor Davis I hope that answers your question yeah thank you Lindsay that uh, answers great um, back to Councillor Martin Jones now Yes, thank you, Leader. I just want to offer some reassurance to Councillor Paul Davis. I mean, having personally been involved in a number of Eston inspections over the years, uh, especially for those who are members of governing bodies, it can be a little daunting. It can be uh, obviously uh, stressful. But as, by, as part of our visits to schools, visits to governing bodies, both the director and I will go out, canvas views uh, on what opinions and comments are out there, and we'll certainly be feeding that into our link Eston inspectors when when they visit the authority. But but Councillor Davis, I'm very very aware that perhaps some governors will feel daunted when confronted by by Eston inspectors. Um, it is it is a a fairly projected projected sort of process, um, but please be reassured, we we will do that when we do our visits. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for that reassurance. Thank you, Martin. We slowly can use the technology. But... Right, thank you, Martin. And uh, I too would like to add my thanks to, to, to all the school staff and the pupils who are just uh, a, well, an extremely important part of it. The pupils, have, they had to behave on those days as well, but hopefully they behave all days, not just on those days. So um, thank you for that question. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Are we all in favour? Yep. All right. right. Thank you for that. That's item four. Item five next. No, sorry, item six next, the learner travel policy. Thank you, Leader. And again, with your permission, I'm going to hand the uh, baton over to Robin Davis on this one, please. Robin, over to you. Thank you, Leader. Um, so the purpose of the report is uh, to uh, report on the outcomes of the consultation exercise approved by Cabinet regarding the proposed changes to the local authorities' home to school transport policy to seek Cabinet's decision on whether or not it should progress with any of the proposals and identify how those proposals would contribute to the overall savings target um, in our medium-term financial strategy. 
So the, the background is that the local authority is a, has a statutory responsibility in relation to home school and college transport uh, set out in the Learner Travel Wales measure. The measure that states that the that local authorities must uh, assess the travel needs of learners in their area, provide free home to school transport for learners of compulsory school age, attending primary schools where they live over two miles uh, or further um, from the nearest suitable school, provide free home to school transport for learners of compulsory school age, attending secondary school where they live over three miles from their nearest suitable school, assess the needs of looked after children in the local authorities area, promote Welsh medium education, promote sustainable modes of travel and where learners are not entitled to free transport, the local authorities have the power to use or exercise discretion um, to provide that trans to provide transport. Um, in Bridge End, we refer, um, we use the, the term near a suitable school and that applies to the local English medium catchment school, um, the nearest Welsh medium school or the nearest voluntary aided faith school of the relevant denomination pupils admitted to special schools are considered on an individual basis. Um, section two of the measure requires local authorities to assess the travel needs of all learners under the age of 19 who receive education or training. Um, this inclu includes those who have reached the age of 19 but started a course when they were under that age. Um, however, there is no statutory duty in the measure to provide free transport for the following learners. Um, so those who have not, are not of statutory school age, and that includes nursery pupils as well as post-16 learners, or where a parent exercises uh, parental choice, um, they attend a, a voluntary aided school where the school is not considered to be the nearest suitable school. There is a complementary document, the Lunar Travel Statutory Provision Operational Guidance, which is published in 2014, and that includes the statutory provision which local authorities must consider in undertaking their responsibilities under the measure. Um, and that comprehensive document um, includes statutory guidance on risk assessing walking routes to school. The measure also provides guidance on circumstances in which the local authority may choose to exercise discretion. The Lunar Travel Policy is closely aligned with our school admission procedures uh, and particularly our school admission policy. Um, um, the, the Council's Home to School Transport Policy is, is a material consideration in respect of the choice of school um, and that is detailed then in our school admission policy we, and in our starting school booklet for parents. Um, so it's an important consideration when parents choose a school for their child, whether or not school transport will be provided. A little bit of history then. In September 2015, Cabinet determined changes to the local authorities' home to school college transport policy uh, at the time in order to make um, MTFS savings um, in 16, 17 and 19, 20. The policy change um, corresponded um, to budget reductions um, proposals, which were imp implemented from September 2016. Um, however, the initial savings were predicated on a full implement implementation of a change of statutory distance um, from the current policy at the time, which was offering um, one and a half miles for primary school children and two miles for secondary school children to two miles and three miles respectively. Um, and that included post-16 learners as well. No change was proposed to the nursery eligibility was at a slightly different distance of one and a half miles. Um, on implementing the policy change at the time, Cabinet determined to protect the entitlement for pupils benefiting from home to school transport at those former distances of one and a half miles for primary and two miles for secondary until they moved schools or moved from one phase of education to another. Um, an example would be moving from primary into secondary education. Um, protection was provided for siblings of children already in receipt at the former distances where they would also uh, benefit from tree free transport at the same policy distance. Um, Cabinet wasn't minded to remove the discretionary arrangement for post 16 learners who would continue to benefit from the same policy distance of three miles as those um, in uh, strategy school age and secondary education. Now, the in receipt and the sibling rule, as we call it, entitlement has meant that you're on you, the number of pupils 
that the policy changes apply to is relatively small, so there haven't been significant efficiency savings on the back of that of those policy changes. Um, parents have challenged, however, that inequality and um, have been critical of the intention of the policy, particularly where there's a family with just one child without siblings, and they've always challenged it on the basis of disadvantage. Um, parents who have been aggrieved that their child has been a detriment in comparison with other children um, who are the peers in, in the same school, maybe living very close in almost in the same street entering in statutory education in either reception or, or year seven, have challenged the safety of walking route to schools in order to address that inequality. So without sufficient formal assessments under the requirement of the aforementioned operational guidance, it's been difficult for the local authority to contest much of the challenge on the availability of walking routes to schools. Without adequate assurance that the routes were available uh, and the authority had followed the relevant procedure outlined in the operational guidance, the local authority wouldn't be in the position to implement the policy decision the cabinet made back in 2015. So, just to summarise, um, in August 2017, the local authority progressed formal risk assessments of the walk, main walking routes across the county borough to ensure that um, we had those available. Um, obviously, that couldn't account for every single route across the county borough, but the, the main arterial routes across the county borough um, were assessed under the statutory guidance, um, and that included quite significant um, investment in consultation with learners, um, with parents as well, and carers at the time. Um, some areas of the county borough are considered to be urban realm, and um, those would be to well-trodden paths through our estates where there's good lighting, um, there's um, footways, etc. Um, the physical assessments of the, the routes were progressed by an independent consultant, um, physical assessments um, were then um, identified and an officer, as I say, was appointed to consult and we produced 12 reports um, on a geographical basis across Bridgend. Um, and there's just reassurance to Cabinet that all the assessments fully followed the statutory requirements outlined in the aforementioned operational guidance. So section five of the local authority's current home to school transport policy identifies that where an available route is um, determined, um, provision may be withdrawn. Um, so where, for example, a route is identified as safe because mitigation has been put in place or whether the route has just been identified as available, parents um, can be given one term's advance notice of the withdrawal of transport and any withdrawal will normally implement be implemented to coincide with the start of an academic year. So following those assessments, leader um, officers identified the impact of fully implementing available walking route assessments following their conclusion by the independent consultants um, on, on those pupils currently benefit from free home to school transport. Um, and identified that such an implementation would be quite significant. Um, however, we have maintained the provision and not withdrawing free home to school transport from those learners where there is an available walking route has created quite significant inequality across Bridgend. Some parts of the county, there are pupils who are able to walk to school on a route identified as available that are still in receipt of home to school transport and they were, reside well under the statutory policy distances. Um, and in other parts of the county borough, pupils live within the same distance who are not receiving free school home to school transport. So there's um, significant inequality across the county borough on that basis. So in July 2019, Cabinet agreed to undertake another 12 week public consultation on a new set of proposals. Um, and those were principally the sibling rule, rule and in receipt protection. Um, and also to provide sufficient savings of £1.869 million. Um, 
the public consultation took place over 12 weeks um, from the 14th of October 2019 to the 5th of January 2020, and there were five policy proposals. I, I won't detail them all now, but it suffice to say that when um, those the outcome of the consultation was reported to Cabinet, at the same time, Welsh Government announced um, a new review of the lunar travel arrangements in Wales, um, and there was high expectation that the review would potentially amend the current policy distances with new legislation. So at the time, Cabinet considered the outcome of the consultation um, in September 2020, but uh, determined to accept Proposal 3, which was a, a relatively contextual proposal around the way we present in the policy specific examples of those special circumstances where the local authority will exercise discretion. Um, it determined not to progress any of the other proposals pending the outcome of Welsh Government's review. Um, however, um, the outcome of Welsh Government's review did not progress as expected and there have been no changes to the Lunar Travel Wheels measure or under statutory distances remain unchanged. Um, Welsh Government did progress or have progressed five recommendations following a very recent report on the review. Um, those are listed under um, paragraph 2.25 uh, up to 2.29. Um, and given that the lunar travel budget has been under significant financial pressure for many years, we've proposed new proposals to support MTFS budget reductions uh, as a separate uh, arrangement uh, and Cabinet approved the consultation on that basis in March 2024. Um, under paragraph 2.31 there is reference to active travel and it's important in terms of the responsibility in terms of changing the way we travel the need for fewer cars on our road and more people using public transport, walking or cycling. So it's relevant uh, or very relevant in the context of the current uh, report. So in terms of the current situation, the proposal, as I say, in March 24, Cabinet determined to progress a new public consultation um, against five proposals and those are listed under Section 3.1. I'll cover those in details as I, as I progress um, through the report. Um, proposal one is the withdrawal of transport for all learners benefiting from an identified and available safe walking route to school uh, in line with the statutory distances of two miles for primary pupils and three miles for secondary pupils, secondary school pupils. Um, following the consultation, there were um, four main areas um, of concern relating to that proposal in particular. Um, under paragraph 3.4, um, either you can see the breakdown of responses uh, in terms of those who didn't and did not agree um, with the proposal. Um, I've summarised under paragraph 3.6 onwards um, some of the main areas of feedback in respect of those concerns, um, but there's a, a full breakdown in Appendix 2. So in terms of safety and well-being, in particular pupils um, being required to walk to school along routes they perceive as unsafe um, was a concern with lots of traffic and poor lighting, especially in the winter months. Um, with increased exposure to an, potential uh, antisocial behaviour uh, behavior and the impact on health, um, both physical and mental, on the journey to school, the impact on a pupil's ability to learn after such a long journey, especially for secondary school pupils walking up to six miles per day, potentially. Um, cost was another issue. A significant proportion of respondents felt that the options available as alternatives to home to school transport were that many did not have a family car, family was already finding the cost of living difficult and that public transport options had been reduced over many years uh, and especially more recently that the cost of public transport was a distinct barrier to getting children safely to school. Um, there was some significant environmental concerns. Many responders stated that the proposal would likely have a negative impact on the environment close to schools. Um, and much of that was about, it was highly unlikely, it was felt highly unlikely the younger pupils would walk to school and therefore it would more, be more likely that they would be driven to school and that would have a consequential impact on the local environment with 
um, greater congestion um, and um, noise uh, and environmental pollution. Um, some responders also identified um, the net zero carbon agenda as important consideration and, and the impact on delivering that ambition. Um, and, and then um, finally, on this proposal, social impact that the current policy arrangements facilitate many families to go to work at the moment and any change or reduction in eligibility may mean that some families may not be able to um, manage that arrangement. In terms of proposal two, then this is the removal of the sibling and in receipt protection for pupils. Um, I would say there was quite some confusion regarding the proposal in that many felt that it would impact siblings differently of different ages. But it's important to clarify that the proposal is to remove the sibling and receipt eligibility from the current policy so all pupils will end up being treated equally. Um, there would not be a situation where when one sibling retains eligibility where others lose that eligibility if that, this proposal was accepted. Um, a summary of the responses under paragraph 3.12 and I would say leader in terms of engaging with pupils um, I did some direct engagement in schools myself and um, pupils did feel particularly that that um, they that, that this was a positive way forward, um, perhaps more so than parents or uh, other responders, as you can see under uh, paragraph 3.12. So in terms of this proposal, the main areas um, response again, social impact, particularly that um, all siblings should be able to travel together on um, buses and if different siblings dif travel at different times that could have an effect on families' ability to manage that um, as they felt it's important to support younger children, younger pupils transitioning into higher stages of education. Safety and well-being were another factor. Um, they felt that uh, younger children are often supported by older siblings on home to school transport. There was ex concerns expressed over more vehicles and congestion outside our schools, particularly at pick up and drop off time. The impact on health, physical and mental in terms of the journey to school um, and, and especially um, especially for second school pupils, given the, um, the, the, the longer journey times and distances. Again, cost, a significant proportion felt that options available for home to school transport um, other than walking to school were limited. Many didn't feel like they had a, a car um, that they could use and public transport options again were limited. Um, so very similar to um, proposal one. Um, Expectation was another area of concern, as well as identify the unfairness of the policy in general. Some respondents identified that there should be some protection in respect to this proposal for existing pupils if this was brought in. So in terms of proposal three, then removal of all transport for nursery pupils, excluding Welsh medium and faith. Um, I would say there was significant discontent with the policy proposal, in particular that responders strongly disagree that there should be protection for people seeking Welsh medium or faith-based education. Again, under, sec under paragraph 3.19, um, Leader, you can see the responses there from the, um, the main groups. Um, other main areas of feedback, again, the detail in appendix two, but social impact um, was an important area that, that they felt that would negatively impact some working parents. Um, however, this needs to be seen in the context of the very small numbers, only 19 nursery pupils currently would lose eligibility, uh, perhaps a figure that the wider public would not be aware of. However, many responders suggested that eligibility should be removed for all nursery pupils or perhaps should be means tested. Um, there were concerns over safety. Young children shouldn't be being transported um, um, on our school transport vehicles, um, but also that walking children of such a young age to school was also unsafe. Um, cost, again, many responders suggested that money would be better spent on non-nursery uh, transport to support um, other uh, pupils and better use to prevent um, other home to school transport cuts being made on that basis um, and perhaps supporting working families uh, as well. Um, under expectation, responders ranged, um, responses ranged from a, a suggestion that a change of policy would present a barrier to working families to the acknowledgement that nursery education is voluntary 
um, and should be at least needs assessed or means tested. So, Robin, and just, Robin, can I just, I'm conscious you do an excellent job going through in detail the report, but can we just um, summarize? Because cabinet members have all got the details there and have read. Okay. And I'm conscious we yeah. have got a very large agenda, so if we can. Um, Happy to do that, Ida. That's 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 fine. I I will I will try to summarize much better. Um, so I. So in terms of proposal four, then you can see that the, that the main areas were around distance, um, the responsibility, um, particularly on parent uh, pupils to accept their own responsibility uh, emerging um, as po young post-16 learners, um, feedback around Welsh medium and faith-based education in terms of inequality there, cost and expectation. Um, and in terms of proposal five, then um, the um the the area was perhaps mostly to do with confusion of that policy area and the fact that many responders felt that we were perhaps making this mandatory when actually it's an offer only of an option of a personal transport budget rather than actually us implementing this um without due consideration of any off uh, any other issues which is clearly not the case so under section 3.36 onwards, there's an assessment of the impact of the policy proposals. Um, I'm, I won't go into any significant detail other than leader just to say I've quantified some of the impact perhaps and what that means for <coughs> current cohorts of learners if the policy was to be implemented as of today, as you'll be aware. The cohorts change on a regular basis and uh, dynamically, but annually as well. And under table one, I've given a flavour for um, what the policy impact would likely be um, if we were to implement all the policy proposals, particularly um, in this case around the big buses. So it's like some significant impact on many schools where currently there is eligibility for, sc for school transport that really um, shouldn't be there and that we've not removed over time. But what, what the proposals are now asking Cabinet to consider is obviously um, to consider removing transport to make those efficiency savings based on those um, current policy proposals. Um, on page 61 then, I've provided some um, options for Cabinet um, which are relatively binary in terms of full implementation or no change to the policy. Um, there is potential uh, a delay, obviously, which is it, there's a delay inherent in the implementation to September any, 2025 anyway, um, but there's potentially a delay in terms of um, coinciding with a people's current phase of education if ca Cabinet is minded to progress that or full implementation from September 2025. Um, I provided under uh, um, table three some figures there around dedicated nursery numbers and contract prices and as Cabinet can see very expensive arrangements for quite small numbers however we are protecting Welsh medium and faith-based education in respect of our policy proposals three and four particularly given our duty to promote and support the Welsh language. So essentially, none, there is no change to our policy arrangements for Welsh medium and um, faith-based education for nursery and post-16. Um, and I, again, um, at table four um, on the bottom of page 63, on the middle of page 63 rather, there are some, there are two policy options for Cabinet to consider either the removal as it's presented, excluding Welsh medium of faith or no change. Um, and similarly for proposal four on page 63, I've provided um, the numbers of post 16 pupils in our secondary schools um, to provide um, cabinet with the detail of the current cohort. Um, I've provided some identification of alternative um, benefits available to low-income families who could use education maintenance allowance potentially to uh, access public transport. That's not acknowledging the fact that public transport in many parts of Bridge End is perhaps not as strong as it was um, pre-pandemic. Um, and also I've provided at the bottom of page 64 the current cost to providing free transport to 
post-16 students attend in Bridge End College, college um, all of whom would lose um, transport eligibility if Cabinet are minded to approve proposal four on that basis. Um, I've also provided some detail under table seven, eight, nine and ten on page 65 of the use um, and take up of the um, transport, um, public service transport passes on the uh, first Cymru, principally first Cymru buses um, and listed um, all the vehicles the um all the buses rather that are being accessed by our students to bridge end college um who are clearly benefiting from those travel passes um to other parts of um the south wales region as well um as i said leader the, it's clear that if we um, the proposal was implemented no student uh, attending bridge end college would be eligible for school transport uh, so that's a approximately 700 current students would lose that entitlement. Um, there have been 75,000 journeys um, between September 23 and 2020, uh, June 24 in use of um, those public service bus passes, so that is significant. Um, but there is an expected efficiency associated with that, um, you know, a, a loan of um, over £200,000 um, that there is significance in terms of all potential alternative journeys to school, um, college rather, and school actually in sixth form, if we weren't providing um, post-16 transport. Um, so although there's an immediate efficiency saving, um, there may be um, implications, particularly around pupils um, not progressing into sixth form, and um, pupils not progressing potentially into post-16 college education, particularly those who are more geographically distant um, from um, the provision from school or college. Um, I meet, mentioned the NEAT agenda under paragraph 3.79 and our current good progress around reducing NEAT in end um, to 1.4% of your 11 learners. Uh, which is below, well below the Wales average of 2%. Um, but also I reference then the impact on Virginia College, potentially the sustainability and the viability of coll the college and of courses um, if um, student numbers were to fall. Um, the policy options um, around um, pro pro policy proposal for that is um, again very binary, it's just either removal um, of the provision excluding Welsh medium and faith schools from September 25 on no change to the policy. Um, and leader, in terms of policy proposal five, um, we do some very small numbers of direct payments at the moment. That is, uh, as I've identified in the policy year, um, potential for significant savings, but also there is significant risk of us not being able to make savings in respect of the implementation of this policy proposal, because there are things we just don't know about how parents will potentially accept and maybe later on reject the offer. And that might cause us problems in terms of additional costs um, if we need to find um, uh, transport for pupils where parents may have chosen um, taken up the offer and changed their minds at a later point in time. Um, I've identified um, some of the personal responsibilities parents would need to progress in terms of the inland revenue rate, 45 pence a mile. Um, and I, under section 3.87, uh, I then summarise the potential impact of the implementation of the policy proposals. I won't go through those again. Uh, that I would be repeating fundamentally what I've said in my students are present in the report, um, but it's important under, under 3.89 that um, we acknowledge that the time in the of the report meant that the scrutiny committee couldn't, um, uh, subject over in scrutiny committee one that met on the 18th of July, um, couldn't provide um, written feedback. So I know Councillor Elaine Stanley, who was the acting chair of that uh, committee is here today to provide uh, a verbal update in terms of the view of the, the scrutiny committee. Um, as I've said, the um, earliest implementation of any of these policy proposals could be September 25. Under section four, I cover off the equality implications. I won't go into significant detail around this 
um, there has been a full quality impact assessment. Um, we are identifying under um, the EIA, um, obviously an impact in terms of Welsh language and religion. We've undertaken a Welsh language impact assessment as well. Um, the local authority is sought to protect both the Welsh language and the and faith-based education as part of its proposals. Um, and actually many of the proposals in respect of that protection, particularly on the Welsh language, um, encourage and promote Welsh medium education in Bridgend schools um, and support our Welsh in education strategic plan. I won't propose to go through section five, the future generation, well-being and future generation implications um, leader. Um, and I'll very briefly reference obviously ch ch climate change implications. I think it's fair to say that um, although there may be a reduction in the numbers uh, of contracts and therefore um, the number of vehicles that the local authority commissions in the delivery of home to school transport, um, there may be a consequential increase in the number of personal transport journeys uh, where ineligible pupils are driven to school by parents. So um, that's an important consideration and um, therefore it, cli uh, climate change implications um, may negative, be negatively Im be impacted by the proposals in that context. Um, I won't mention safeguarding and corporate preparing implications. They are not changed as a result of any of the policy proposals because um, they are covered by statute. And in terms of financial implications, I think it's very clear and Cabinet will be well cited on the medium term financial savings, the amount of investment and uh, an increased budget that's been provided to the home to school transport budget over time um, and the you know, projected overspend at the end of 24-25 of at least £1.2 million, even with the significant year-on-year -year increase to the local authorities' home to school transport budget. Um, table 12 then provides the potential approximate annual savings for the proposals. Um, and uh, leader then, I'll take you to the recommendations, which I'm sure now Cabinet are well cited on. And as I've said, um, Cabinet can progress uh, any of the proposals, uh, or any combination of the proposals it sees fit. So I'll stop there and I'll hand back to you, Leader. Right. Thank you, Robin, for that comprehensive um, report. It's an important uh, cabinet report here. Uh, we've got some discussion to take place, but before we go any further, we need to um, take note. We have the uh, councillor Lehman Stanley here providing feedback from scrutiny, and this is part of the, the pre decision scrutiny process that we're trying to do so that scrutiny have the opportunity to debate and provide uh, their recommendations to us before the decision is made. So, Councillor Stanley, could I ask you to provide any feedback from the last week's um, SOC 1 committee? Thank, Thank you. you. OK, so we met and discussed at length, as you would imagine, something this important, and we have 12 recommendations to make. I'm not proposing to read them all out in detail because I believe Cabinet have had copies of this from Democratic Services. However, I will go through um, them in summary. Um, so the first three recommendations are general recommendations. Um, our first recommendation is just to ensure that our care experienced ch children are exempt from any um, loss of transport um, because that could be detrimental to their development. Uh, second recommendation is to ensure that there has been sufficient analysis of the impact of both past and current proposals on attendance in particular, um, because we were startled to discover just how poor um, attendance had dropped in um, some schools. Um, recommendation number three is about the importance of communications with both parents and with um, the pupils involved um, so that they would be able to make decisions. Um, obviously, uh, children who are currently doing their uh, GCSEs now would be making decisions of, over whether they'd go to Bridge End College, but they need to know whether or not they would lose their transport entitlement in 2025 when they're halfway through their course. 
So that is an important thing that they need to know. So the communication is really important. Okay, and then we went to the recommendations on each proposal. So proposal number one was on the nurse, nursery accommodation. Oh, the sibling, no. Um, yes, removal or uh, withdrawal of transport for all learners benefiting from an available walking route. So this is the safe routes. Um, and we had a number of recommendations about safe routes, um, making sure that they're regularly monitored, um, that there is a way to feedback whether those routes are now unsafe due to lack of lighting. Um, and due to um, also we've had um, seasonal uh, growth um, of making routes impassable. So that, that there needs to be that regular monitoring. Um, recommendation five is about how children are treated in school um, if they've got very wet due to their walking. Um, and also exploring with contractors the times that they, they are arriving at schools to, um, to minimise waiting times for both pupils and te teachers. Um, there's also um, the, the, looking at the capacity issue. This, these proposals may make it more attractive to go to Welsh medium or faith-based schools. Um, have they got the capacity um, to uh, increase their intake? Um, I believe Archbishop McGrath is already oversubscribed, for example. And although we are hoping to build new Welsh uh, medium schools in the borough, they will not be ready um, by 2025. Um, then I'm going on to um, further proposal number four, which is about the um, post-16 um, transport. And this, of course, is the one that we had the most uh, fears about how this would impact on our pupils. Um, we looked at the impact on bus routes and bus times. And for example, there aren't always good public transport links. Um, and for pupils, for example, in my stake, they are really struggling to have a bus that gets to my stake comp at a time that is useful. It either arrives an hour before school or after they should have arrived. So if we can communicate and make arrangements with bus routes and ensure that there is available transport so that option is available for them. So that's basically recommendation six and seven um, that we explore um, that with bus companies. Recommendation eight is to explore with Bridgend and Pencoid colleges whether they would be able to support their learners, because obviously without the free bus passes, they're at a detriment, as has been said by Robin. Recommendation nine is about the whether the changes would be in line with the local authorities' commitments under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Uh, recommendation 10 is about the impact on vulnerable pupils in particular who might not be able to afford a bus pass to access post-16 education and therefore they're at higher risk of becoming not in education or um, employment. Um, the committee recommends that consideration be given to this and the potential of a means-tested scheme for pupils considered as vulnerable. Recommendation number 11 looks at whether the clarification about the mileage allowance, which would be available to parents who are happy to transport their, their children to school. And obviously we need to just check that they wouldn't have any uh, tax detriment or whether it have an implication on their benefits. And then recommendation 12 is that's a quite a long recommendation, but it's all about monitoring what is going on and making sure that we ha are not putting ch children at detriment. Um, thank you. Those are our recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Stanley, and, and thanks to the, the old committee for um, giving the time to go through that report with all those recommendations. They're not ones I suppose we have all the answers to today, but they're definitely ones that we need to take into consideration, um, either as part of our deliberation now and decision, as well as moving forward, um, and it would be interesting some of the ones about the bus timetables and the bus routes and Penco Co College, where they can uh, possibly contribute uh, and help in the future. But um, first now I'll move to um, Councillor Martin Jones. Uh, thank you, Leela. First and foremost, could I please move the report? Is that seconded? I'll second, Chair. 
Okay. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, can I thank Robin uh, Davis and Councillor Wynne Stanley for their contribution to the presentation of this report this afternoon? Uh, the report unfortunately recommends rele reluctant changes to our learner transport services. Reluctant changes in the face of rising costs, reduced budgets, and ongoing need to save money. To put this into context, Leader, in 2020 to 2021, uh, we spent £6 million on learner transport services. This increased to £10 million in 2023, 2024, and there is a projected overspend in this current financial year of £1.2 million. So these costs are clearly not sustainable under the current MTFS. Could I take this opportunity to thank all those who participated and supported the public consultation process, which was carried out between April and July of this year. Uh, and as mentioned by Robin, this is on the back of two previous consultations carried out in 2014, 2015 and 2019 for the same subject matter. We received 1,308 response, responses, in addition to the feedback received from digital engagement and public events at various schools across the county borough. Leader, I accept there was significant public objection to four of the proposals. There was support for proposal two. I share the public concern. However, with the reduced budget to provide educational support and services across the county borough, difficult decisions have to be made. I presented the report to Scrutiny 1 last week uh, under a pre-decision process, and I'm very grateful for the committee for their advice and guidance. And Councillor Wynne Stanley this afternoon has outlined a number of general comments and recommendations that the committee have sought to make. Secu Scrutiny committee members who are also accessing cabinet, this cabinet meeting this afternoon will recall that I gave, a, a, I gave a commitment that I would address all the unintended consequences that the proposed policy change will present to children, young people, their families, and the wider communities. I gave a commitment to monitor this impact and focus on such issues such as increased absenteeism, post-16, and perhaps an increase in NEET, that is young people who uh, are not in education or in any sort of training. The potential increase in personal vehicle traffic outside schools, for example. These were many of the suggestions were made uh, by the committee and they will be considered as we move forward. Nida, I'm sure you'd agree, this is not a situation where we as a cabinet make a decision and then simply move forward. To September 2025, we will monitor the impact that this policy change will create and we will do everything we can under a one council approach to support those people who unfortunately will be caught up in this change. So I present the support to cabinet colleagues for approval and implementation, implementation in September 25, a report that presents reluctant changes to our learner transport services. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Jones. I will now go to the Deputy Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay uh, and Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones, I wish to make a, an amendment to the recommendations this afternoon, and that is that we propose to defer, I propose to defer proposal number five. I don't think we've got the information that we need. I do think that we need to understand the implications of that and the cost to us. As the report indicates, we don't know if this will save any money. We really are unsure of that. I think we need to do a wider bit of work around um, a specific policy and the implementation of that policy. And I would refer you to social services uh, report this afternoon, which is around, is around financial management for some of our residents. Um, leader, um, 
so uh, and just with your indulgence it's uh, uh, for reassurance for scrutiny committee uh, that one of their recommendations is about the care experienced child our care experienced children when we're dealing with anything to do with education it is part of their care planning arrangements and we would make those arrangements as part of that care planning process because we need to ensure that attendance is ongoing and it might be that a, a, a care experienced child may only be moved for a month to six months as an example we wouldn't necessarily wish to disrupt any educational provision at that point because the the, the hope is that they would return home and stay in the same school so we are very cognizant of that arrangement and it is something that we pick up but i i am proposing that we defer proposal number five this afternoon because i do think we need to do a further piece of work from that thanks very much leader thank you deputy leader thank you for that and, and thank you Mark, and uh, Councillor martin jones we say we'll, we'll monitor things going forward because there will quite likely be unintended consequences we're not aware of um but we need to you know, address things as they come up and deal with things uh, over the next year and going and beyond that. Um, but we there was a proposal there to remove a recommendation to remove proposal five. The first uh, recommendation was moved and seconded. Councillor Paul Davis. Would you like to remove that? We I'm forward. prepared to second Councillor Gabby's amendment, Chair, if we can. Okay. Yep. Do you happy with that? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to say something? Any I, I do want to yep. ask questions well, if I can. Over to you then. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Robin, for the report. It's very insightful, let's say. Um, and for Councillor Wynne Stanley's um, contributions of the committee. I'd also like to echo um, the remarks made by Councillor Jones, the, the, the Cabinet Member for Education. He put it over very well. And um, yeah, we, we shall definitely do that, Martin, your, your proposals. I've got a couple of very quick questions for Robin, if uh, that's okay, if you indulge me, Chair. I, I don't know if I missed it, Coy. I was writing something down, Robin. Um, point two, proposal two, the recommendations. In receipt, what does that mean? Firstly. Okay. Um, is it either is okay if I can respond? Yeah, yeah. Robin, yeah, please. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Yeah, the in receipt protection was essentially. Um, where a child under the former policy arrangements back in 2015, um, Cabinet changed the policy to, to be implemented from September 16, changed the policy distance from, for example, in primary schools at that time, it was eligibility over one and a half miles. In September 16, it changed to two miles. But what Cabinet determined was that if a child was already in primary education, they would continue to receive it at that older policy distance of one and a half miles until they left that phase of education. But then there was a, a corresponding sibling protection um, uh, element in the policy, which meant they could then pass on that eligibility to their brothers and sisters as they entered primary education. Now, the in receipt protection is all but petered away because we're talking about eight years ago, but this is the sibling protection that we still see being passed on to brothers and sisters even eight years later, and that's the, what's created that inequality. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Robin. What, one more question, if you um, Bear in mind what we said about uh, point five, um, and the, and the, we, we've, we've just proposed to put that on hold, uh, uh, Robin. Um, are there any other mitigations for the removal of, of these of these um, benefits that we've mentioned today that we, you can think of? We sort of have some re reassurance for parents. Anything? Uh, in terms of the, the all the policy proposals that well, we're asking us to do? Of the, of the bus passes, etc. and um, the, all these different, yeah, all these different things we mentioned. Anything, mitigation we could possibly give some hope? Well, um, it's it's very difficult um, because I suppose our power is limited. I mean, there, I mentioned the EMA education maintenance allowance benefit, which is available to the low income families. I think what's fair is many of the families um, are working families who are saying as a result of some of the policy proposals would be detrimentally impacted because of the way that they've set up their lives in terms of children going into nursery education. Um, 
children on the buses or don't have to worry about getting them to school. Um, so it's very difficult. So we can, we can see uh, and, and we heard from the public. And I want to personally thank the public for responding, as um, Councillor Martin Jones has said, particularly at all, but you know, also the pupils I had the pleasure of engaging with in the schools who were very, very articulate in the way that they were expressing their concerns and you know what happens in September 25 to me. Um, so, um, you know, fully take on board, you know, all the implications and some of those very difficult decisions that will you know, need to be made. But as a local authority, I know much of the role that we will um, will progress, you know, will be, as Councillor Jones has said, about monitoring, certainly signposting where we can, where parents and carers may not understand perhaps where there is eligibility for other support mechanisms to be um, to accessed. Um, so, you know, when we'll ask schools and work with schools to ensure that there's relevant information um, out there in the public domain um, to ensure that, um, you know, parents are maximising the, the, the availability of any support services or networks available to them and possibly working together uh, on that basis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Robin. Next to Councillor Howard Williams. Uh, yeah, thank you, Leader, and uh, thank you, Robin, for presenting the report. This is clearly um, a significant policy change for the authority, and uh, a lot of the concerns, I suppose, are can be generalised in that they are what are the unintended consequences of a policy change like this. And I think that the you no, know, to be fair, that the scrutiny committee's recommendation twelve that really does encapsulate that ongoing monitoring is going to be critical here. And I'm happy to support the cabinet members' um, uh, commitment and that we will certainly monitor any unintended consequences there, and we will have to meet those unintended consequences at the at the future point. So I, I'll just run through them uh, very briefly, and that is like you no know, the capacity issues in in Welsh medium and faith schools. If parent choice uh, does, does sort of uh, you no know, take them that, down that path, then uh, then we need to understand that. I'm also concerned about cost being a barrier to learning. Now, I know we've got an education maintenance allowance, but what about families that just come outside the threshold for, for that? So, you know, that is a very key consideration to me. I really would not want cost to be a barrier to, uh, to, to further education. And I suppose quite a significant one as well is the impact on climate change. Uh, we just really do need to understand the impact on that because, you know, this could create um, well traffic chaos outside our schools, and so uh, and we need, just need to monitor the impact of that as well. And uh, I'm quite happy to support the deputy leader's recommendation to to remove proposal five at the moment, because I think with the um, the parental confusion there, that certainly warrants uh, further work, and uh, and maybe we can sort of um, tidy that uh, policy up and bring it forward at a later date. So uh, just with those comments, I'm happy to support the recommendation with amendments, and um, yeah, we'll certainly monitor the impact of this going forward. Thank you, leader. Thank you, Councillor Williams. That was a very good points and again, and uh, as we stated right at the beginning, so this is not a position we really want to be in. We, we have the medium-term financial strategy, and included in the report, it identifies where we have to, we need to find at least seven hundred ninety-two thousand pounds saving. Um, so we, we're in a position where we we need to progress with making these savings. There isn't enough money in the pot there. It's not a position we want to be in, but we need to be providing services in line with what's been funded from Welsh government and. We are, have been providing in excess of the funding from Welsh Government. So it's been moved and seconded originally, then there's been an amendment moved and seconded to remove Proposal 5. Take it to all in favour for that. There's two of us here in the Chamber, three online. Comes Martin Jones. Yes, yeah, I, I'm more than happy for for policy five um, to be refer to be removed uh, from the decision making this afternoon. However, I would err on caution that we may very well have to revisit this policy suggestion later in the day when we get that further information uh, that uh, our deputy leader has just uh, suggested. So I'm happy for for that to go ahead, uh, and that we just do policy one, two, three, and four as a decision-making this afternoon. Thank you, Leader. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Jones. Over to Deputy Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Leader. Uh, my only concern would be I would like a time frame around that information we request around the ALN and proposal number five. I do think it's something we need to address, but I just don't think we're in a position to address it this afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Deputy Leader. Uh, Lindsay, I'm not sure if it's anything, how easy it is to put a time scale or something on there, because that, that's a, a five is the difficult one to put a figure on or even assess at the moment. Thanks, Nita. I think the, the, the deputy suggestion is a good one. Um, obviously, to give this cabinet um, relevant information, I think it's sensible for us to take this away as officers, consider it and come back with then with uh, informed information with regard to a time scale, if that's OK with you and the deputy leader, Leader. Thanks so. Yep, yeah, OK with that. Yep, deputy is thumbs up. So, let's be moved and seconded for proposal one, two, three and four and removing proposal five and I take it all in favour. Right. Yep. Okay. It's now exactly four o'clock on my PC. So pause for a quick ten minute come for break with you an hour and a half. A quick ten minutes and we we'll restart again at sixteen ten hours. So apologies to those who are online, but if we can um have a quick ten minutes, we'll start again, sixteen ten.